Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. I'm going to uh, take a break from our series on the book of Acts to start a new series called Discerning the Times because of what we're living in right now. Is that okay? That'd be good? Yeah. Brandon did a great job wrapping up Acts 3. We had a little break as a past appreciation. By the way, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all the pastors here for your cards, your letters, your messages, uh, the gifts that you gave us last week, and the board treated us to a beautiful dinner out in the lobby uh, yesterday afternoon. Our volunteers helped us with that. We just want to say that we feel the love and support and just want to say thank you for extending and expressing, expressing that appreciation to us. It means a lot. And uh, again, we couldn't do this without you, the church body. So the pastors need the body. The body needs pastors, as Pastor Kuhn taught last week. So we're a team together. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, I want to I take a moment to just hit pause, just take a break from the Acts series and really just take a look at the times that we're living in. And with our Bible in hands, try to discern what's going on, right? I think everyone knows, and we've been watching what's taking place in the Middle East, and it's gotten the entire world's attention. And no matter where you stand on last day events, you can't get away from the mentions of Israel and the surrounding nations in end times prophecy. Uh, I want to help you if you're new to the faith or maybe you're seeking God. We're going to go into what we call prophecy scripture uh, the Bible is full of it, and much is still to be uh, fulfilled yet in the end times. And one of the questions that people have is, does, does war in Israel have end times connections? And I'm here to tell you, absolutely. Yes. Uh, to what extent are we in those prophecies right now? Well, we don't fully know. I can't really tell you that. Uh, but what we can do is look at Scripture to get guidance from Jesus and his word on how we should be um, looking at what's going on. Does that sound good? So if you would uh, open up your word to Matthew 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24, we're going to be in verse 1. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking to his disciples here about the future. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. It would also be on the screen for you. The title of this message and the sign that we're going to focus on discerning right now is wars and threats of wars. One translation says wars and rumors of wars. Okay? So wars and threats of wars. Do we have the slides? Are they working okay? <clears throat> Just want to double check on that. Sometimes that, that collapses as well on us, the machine. All right, so Matthew 24, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings, but he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished, demolished. not one stone will be left on top of the other, or one another. <clears throat> Pause real, real quick, we believe this was actually fulfilled in AD 70 when Rome destroyed the temple, and it hasn't been rebuilt since, just so you know. Uh, verse 3 says, later, Jesus sat at the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Sign. Okay, not exact moment, but signs. They wanted the exact moment, but even Jesus said that no man knows the time or the day or the hour when he will return. Okay. But what signs? So that's what I want to do for a short series here right now is we're going to look at signs and we're going to discern them because signs help us see when the time is getting closer. You follow me on that? And if, and if you listen to people who start giving you exact dates when Jesus is, uh, is coming back, go ahead and turn that off and don't listen to that person ever again. All right? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Now, if people have apologized for that and they've kind of repented from that kind of teaching and they've changed their ways, then maybe give them another chance, right? We should. But for the most part, if people are still claiming exact days or times, even Jesus says, I don't even know the exact day or time. All right? 
So what sign, what signal to the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let, verse 4, don't let anyone mislead you. Okay, there you go. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars or rumors of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Let's say don't panic. Don't panic. Okay? Don't panic. That was Jesus. Or your translation, some translations say don't be alarmed. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes. Have you seen those recently? In many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Now, don't be that guy or that gal who goes, okay, birth pains tend to happen in the third trimester. <laughs> so therefore, we probably have about this many weeks. No, no, let's not do that, okay? Jesus is not asking you to do that, okay? But he uses the analogy of, uh, of a pregnant woman to give the idea that when she begins to feel that, the time is getting closer, right? The time is getting closer. If you're a husband, you don't know what to do. You're just like, what, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> Lamaze class, Lamaze class. What is that? Yeah. All right. Okay. What does Jesus say here? Uh, don't panic. Don't be alarmed. And they're asking, when's the end? When will, when will there, your, the signal be of your return and the end of the world? And he only gives signs. That's it. And you know why Jesus gives us signs? So that we won't be surprised. I actually wanted to title this series, I'm Not Surprised. Because I'm not. And I'm not troubled either. Because Jesus gave us a heads up. Jesus gave us a heads up so that we could have confidence and he has given us very particular signs that we're going to cover for the next few weeks that, make, that should comfort you, actually, not make you scared. Because that means what he did here is he, he loves you, and he's giving you a heads up so that you won't be afraid. But instead, you will look up for his return. All right? So everyone can calm down. All right? We can all relax a little bit. We don't know when. But he said, first, when you see these things, you know, there's birth pains and time will come soon, but not yet. Still things must take place, okay? And according to a conflict data program, conflicts causing at least 1,000 deaths in one calendar year are considered wars, okay? Just using that measurement. Let's just go with that measurement, okay? And it's the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. You can see this online. The program has recorded 282 wars between 1946 and 2019. So it even left out World War I, World War II. However, considering the past 2,000 years, the number of wars would be much higher. If you add World War I, II, if you would add the Ukraine war that's taking place right now and the war in Israel, the number is at least 286. We know there's many more, though. We're just talking about a short amount of time, but since Jesus said these things, there have been hundreds or over a thousand wars that have taken place in human history. It's the increasing of war that gets our attention, isn't it? But it's also the increase of where it's at. War and conflicts are actually commonplace in this land, in Israel. So here's three reasons, though, to discern this war. I'm going to cover three reasons to discern this war. If I have time, I'm going to do a quick recap of what I taught Wednesday night about the history of conflict in Israel, okay? So just buckle up. You ready? Okay, here we go. All right, three reasons to discern this war. Number one, first, all the biblical end time signs are increasingly glowing, highlighting the conflict in Israel. What do I mean by that? Well, if this conflict was just Hamas and Israel um, in war here or in, in, in the conflict, okay, if, if Hamas attacks Israel, Israel retaliates. If it was just them, we would probably think, oh, here you go again, just another, you know, conflict in Israel and, and in Gaza Strip. But for me as a pastor and as a believer, what I'm seeing is all the other signs at the same time. They're all increasing. Let me give you an example of what I mean, what I mean here. Wickedness has increased. 
apostasy, which means that the people of God falling away from the Lord, the church abandoning God's word is increasing. Entire denominations are being split. I'll get to that in this series. Uh, weather events that have increased. Now, some may argue that it's actually because we have better machines to measure all the, all the events taking place, but the devastation has been greater and worse. The rapid spread of information across the world because of the internet. And now we have Elon Musk's Starlink satellite that goes through the sky and everyone thinks it's an alien invasion, but it's just his Starlink, just in case you see that, the strand of balls of light. It's actually his satellite system to provide internet to locations that can't get it, which would help spread the information in the end times. Then we also have the fact that right now they could rebuild the Jerusalem if they want, uh, the new temple if they wanted to in Jerusalem. When you see all these signs increasing and the readiness is taking place, a war or conflict in Israel kind of gets your attention. Why is that? Because there's, a war, there's wars mentioned in Israel in the end times prophecy. I'm about to get to that, but number two, why are we discerning this right now? Number two, okay, the regathering of Jews to Jerusalem or to Israel in 1948. For almost 2,000 years, the Jews were dispersed and have not lived peacefully in their homeland. They were given this land by God in the Old Testament uh, around 1,250 years before Jesus' birth, okay, 1250 B.C., they began to take the land in Canaan. Some argue maybe 1200 uh, or, or 1000 BC. So 1250 BC to 1000 BC, they began to take the land in Canaan. Well, they lost that and they were dispersed in AD 70 when Rome destroyed everything. So for almost 2000 years, they haven't been in their homeland. But they were regathered in 1948 after the atrocities with the Holocaust and World War II. Everyone follow me on that? And in one day, they became a nation again. Okay, so it's, it's incredible how this happened. Now, why is that important? For end times prophecy to exist, in the end, there had to be a nation of Israel there for other scriptures to be fulfilled. Let me give you an example. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Now, that happened one time in the Old Testament when Babylon uh, when they were taken to Babylon, then they went back to Jerusalem. But these scriptures also point to the future because look at Amos 9, 14 through 15. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. That's key. Never again be uprooted. Never again. So, they were uprooted in AD 70, so that couldn't be referring to Babylon when they took them out of Jerusalem and destroyed everything. This must be in 1948, they were regathered and became a state again, which by the way, Jews have no land except for this piece of land to call their own. None. This is it. This is the only little piece they get that they have right now. So we believe these prophecies were fulfilled when the Jews were brought back to their land in 1948, okay? And they didn't force their way in. They didn't, they actually were given this, all right? Now that they're back in the land, certain end time prophecies can be fulfilled because they have to be there in order for this to take place. And it says that they would never again be dispersed or sent out. So here's our third reason why we're discerning this war in Israel and, and I am keeping a close eye. The activity in the Middle East region is very similar to end time prophecy when nations surround Israel for war. And we can read about this, Gog of Magog, in Ezekiel 38 through 39. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Ezekiel 38. It's in the Old Testament. Okay, I already marked mine. Just like, Oh, did I? I forgot to. Oh, I'm going to be just like you and look for it. You can start finding after Jeremiah. Okay. I don't know where Jeremiah is. Well, it's, eh, that's a good point. All right, Jeremiah's in the Old Testament as well. There's a lot of prophets in here. Use the front of your Bible. It's okay. No one's going to judge you if you don't know where it's at. All right. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. If you see Isaiah, Jeremiah, you'll see Ezekiel. 
If you see Ezekiel, or if you see Daniel, you've gone too far. All right, here we go. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. This is another message that came to me from the Lord, son of man. Turn and face Gog of the land of Magog, the prince who rules over the nations of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So this is God asking the prophet Ezekiel to turn to the north and speak to them, to the leader of the land of Magog, okay? Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. Uh Uh-oh. God is against this people that's going to come against Israel. It's not good for them. I would turn you around. You ready for this? This, God's involved in this, this, this prophecy. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws to lead you out with your whole army, your horses and charioters in full armor and a great horde, armor, shields, and swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya will join you too with all their weapons. Gomer and all its armies will also join you along with the armies of Beth Togomara from the distant north and many others. Keep that in note, many other nations. Get ready, be prepared, keep all the armies around you mobilized and take command of them. A long time from now, you will be called into action. In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. There you have it. Now listen, real quick, I'm not a geopolitical ambassador of any sort. I'm not an expert or anything like that. But one of the things that I wonder is how did Israel get attacked so easily? And right here, it's interesting. It says that they were enjoying peace. And it has been said that recently Israel had let their guard down a little bit. I'm not sure. Let their guard down a little bit because there were talks of peace with Hamas. And they let their guard down and then they were attacked. They were tricked. Okay, that's one of the theories out there. I'm not... I am not an Israeli ambassador for America or anything like that. Okay, I'm just putting this out there. There has to be this understanding that there's peace, and that's why they, they weren't ready for this. Okay, and they were caught off guard. And there's, it goes on. Um, you and your allies, a vast and awesome army, will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Okay, do we see a vast army right now coming around them and coming down on their land? Not completely yet. No. What we see is we see Hamas, we see Hezbollah at the top, we see Yemen shooting rockets, we see nations coming around them, surrounding them, we do, but we don't see a horde or cloud of army coming against them yet, do we? So are we seeing the birth pains for them? Are we seeing the staging of this great uh, war that's going to take place where they're going to be surrounded? Possibly. We're not sure. That's why I'm not putting my finger on it and saying this is what it is. Not yet. I can't do that. As a good pastor, i got to be careful. Okay? All right, let me keep reading. This is what the sovereign Lord says. At the time, evil thoughts will come to your mind, and you will devise a wicked scheme. You will say Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages, and that is true. Not every village is walled. I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. I will go to those for merely... or formerly desolate cities that are now filled with people who have returned from exile in many nations. I will capture vast amounts of plunder for the people are rich with livestock and other possessions now. They think the whole world revolves around them. But Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish will ask, do you really think the armies you have gathered can rob them of silver and gold? Do you think you can drive away their livestock and seize their goods and carry off plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy against God. So God says once again to Ezekiel, Look to Gog and say this, give him this message from the sovereign Lord. When my people are living in peace in their land, then you will rouse yourself. You will come from your homeland in the distant north with your vast cavalry and your mighty army. And you will attack my people Israel, covering the land like a cloud. And at that time in the distant future, I will bring you against my land as everyone watches. And my holiness will be displayed by what happens to you, Gog. Then all the nations will know that I am Lord. What's going to happen is God's going to fight for his people and the countries around are going to be destroyed. Let me show you something. Let me show you a map. 
I purposely did not put an arrow to show you where Israel is. Just so you can see what the Israeli state looks like on a map. It's so tiny. Can you find it? To the top left is the Mediterranean Sea. You see Cyprus, Lebanon, and then you see Israel below that. That's the little piece of land that they have. Right now, about 10 million to 11 million citizens in Israel, about 2 million of those are Palestinians living in Israel as citizens of Israel. Okay? And look at the size of the nations surrounding them. They are huge and powerful and vast. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Scholars are trying to take these lands from biblical times like Persia, uh, like Gog and Magog, like Tubal, okay, who are these people? Well, they've done a really good job, actually, of locating where they are geographically. That's what I want to focus on right now in, in my main point. I'm not saying that the war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is what's taking place right now. What I believe, though, is happening is God is showing us that his word is true and that when you see these nations come around Israel, that's a sign that, once again, his, his word prophetically is accurate. When that takes place, well, I'll give you two views today before I'm done, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly yet, okay? And I'm being careful myself, but I'll give you where people stand on these things. But for instance, Gog and Magog really refer to people up north. I don't even have this on there, but it's referring to Russia, way up there. Now, we know Russia actually supports and gives arms to these countries. Did you know that Russia has an airstrip in Syria? Because Russia helped Syria, Syria gave them an airstrip. Israel just blew up two of their airstrips, so Russia opened theirs up for Syria just recently. So Russia is definitely involved in this whole thing, okay? And you do your reading. This is on, this is on right now, on the news. This is on documents. This is in, in uh, articles online that are uh, credible art articles as well, historians and people following what's going on, okay? And then when it comes to other countries like uh, Meshach and Tubal, they're Turkey, have you looked at what Turkey's president has said recently? He doesn't like Israel. And he's on the UN. He's a member of the UN, of NATO. Okay? Then you have Persia, which everyone knows is Iran. Look at Iran on the right. They have been funding Hamas and have been funding terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas to attack. They have been giving them arms. They have helped them strategize. The president of Iran years ago said he wants Israel wiped off the face of the map. Again, I'm not an ambassador to any nation. I'm just telling you the Bible says this stuff's going to happen. Okay, so I'm coming from a biblical Christian perspective. All right, not a political perspective. So you see all these nations surrounding Israel. The Bible's saying they're going to come around them like Israel, like a great cloud to attack. Here's what kind of messes up our theology sometimes, though. If it's the war in Ezekiel 38, 39, it's God drawing them to do this so he can fulfill his purposes. And a lot of people, you know, don't like that. But let me remind you that his ways are not your ways. And his thoughts are not your thoughts. And he, will, he knows what he's doing more than we do. So what we see here is, is people in Turkey will come against. I just saw this uh, recently. Uh, Jews were not allowed to eat in a restaurant in Turkey. So the racism and anti-Semitism, uh, sorry, excuse me, anti-Semitism is increasing. Racism is increasing against them all around the world. Are you aware what happened in Russia recently where Jews are trying to get off a plane and a mob of uh, a mob is coming against them, trying to get a hold of them. They had to hide in the plane, okay, and make sure they stayed safe because they were going, who knows what was going to happen to them. Citizens from Israel on a flight to, to Russia, and a mob is waiting for them. So this increasing spirit against God's people, or I should say a spirit against God's people, an anti-Christ spirit has risen up around the world coming against God's plan. Do you see that? I'm about to get into a, a, the spiritual conflict behind the physical conflict, but let me not get ahead yet. So right now, what we're seeing are, I believe, uh, precursors 
um, rehearsals, uh, a setup for what would take place in the end times, okay? We're not seeing that happen right now, but here are two theories of when this may take place. One is the theory that this happens before the seven-year tribulation, maybe around the taking of the church, which is also called the rapture or being caught up with the Lord, around that time, and here's why. There has to be tension for the Antichrist to say, I know the answer to peace. So could it be right now that this tension has to happen, this uh, unrest and war has to happen, so that the Antichrist comes on the scene and says, well, I know the answer to peace, let's sign a peace treaty. So that would happen before the tribulation or right at the beginning, okay? And the question is, is the church still here? Does the church see that and then they're taken? Uh, there's a lot of theories on this, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I'm not getting into all that today, okay? And boy, will you get dizzy if you read all that. The other belief is, if you're doing biblical interpretation, Gog and Magog are mentioned in Revelation 20, 1 through 7, and that's the war, that the, the last final war after the millennial reign of Christ. So after the seven-year tribulation, uh, there's a great war of Armageddon, then there's a millennial reign of Christ, and then one more time Satan is released to test the loyalty of people who believe during the millennial reign, and then there's the war of Gog and Magog. So some people connect Ezekiel 38, 39 to Revelation 20. Some people don't. Some people say this is different. Here's why. In, Re in Ezekiel 38, it says they wanted the plunder and God was pulling the hook. All right. And in uh, Revelation 20, it shows that Satan was behind it all and they weren't going for plunder. Okay. So there's different views on that. Now, if you're interpreting scripture, whenever you see cross-references of Gog and Magog, you go, hmm, this looks like after the millennial reign, this will happen. Okay, are you getting dizzy yet? And I'm only giving you two views, there's more. All right, here's my point. It's not about the timing for me. Because I'm ready. I'm ready to go whenever I need to go. And you need to be ready whenever you're ready to go. All right. And here's the thing. If people aren't ready, I'm not waiting until the last minute to get them ready. I'm doing it now. Why do, you think I was out, out, why do you think I was out at CR school building bridges with the community? Just so we could have popcorn and hot dogs? No, so I could share with them the love of Christ. So I could build relationships with them and help them. All right? Of course, I had like an allergy attack, like hay fever, and I had to leave early. It was awful. And I'm still recovering today. But anyway. So, eh, let me get back on track here. So, I'm, I'm trying to get people ready now. That's why I do what I do. Not just on Sundays, but throughout the whole week. That's what we do. That's what all believers are supposed to do is get people ready now. Okay? But here's my point. Geographically, the Bible says that these nations will come against Israel. That's exactly what's happening right now. You can't even argue that. Try to dispel that fact. You can't. It's incredible and scary and at the same time, confirming scripture, giving you confidence that God gave you a heads up so you will not be surprised. All right? All right, moving forward. What's behind all this is a spiritual war. A spiritual war. Ephesians 6, 12, I call this behind the veil. Behind the veil, this conflict in Israel, what's the spiritual conflict? Ephesians 6, 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Genesis 3, Satan came against God right away. And then he influenced Cain, and, and Cain's sinful life was aroused because Adam and Eve fell, right? So now you have the sinful nature, the, the, uh, the willing choice to disobey God brought in a sinful nature into mankind, and now Cain is also sinning in his heart and God calls him out on it and he doesn't stop himself and he kills his brother Abel. And he was jealous because Abel's gift was offered and, and, and Cain's, or it was accepted and Cain's offering was not. Do you think Satan's a little jealous too that he's been, he's not Jesus? Has the same spirit, doesn't it? All right. Well, 
actually, 1 John chapter uh, 3, verse 12 says, we must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. Well, the violence continues because the world became so bad that in the days of Noah, God had to cleanse the earth. And you might think that that's like really messed up of God. It's actually mercy. Because if he didn't do that, we would be annihilated. We wouldn't exist. You and I would not exist if the evil went unchecked back in the Old Testament. We wouldn't be here. It was so bad. And I can't even say some of the things that were taking place at that time because of children in the room and young people in the room. But it was awful. So he cleanses the world through, through that. But then he wants to build a new people. I'm fast forwarding here in Israel history. This is in scripture. If you've been reading through your Bible plan, you've seen this. Genesis 12, verse 1. I want to go to that because God establishes a promise to create a new nation of people that he will bless and help. And he calls Abram. And he chose Abram. He created a chosen people. And from Abram would become the Jewish nation. Did you know, though, that Abraham or Abram was not a Jew? Everyone assumes that he is. There was no Jews at this time. There was only Gentiles, only many nations. When God chose Abram to be his uh, chosen person, to bring forth a great nation of descendants that would bless all people, once, that, once they became large enough to be a nation, which people look back at Exodus chapter 1, they were so numerous, Pharaoh was afraid of the Israelites because they became a large nation. And by the way, they became a nation in persecution and slavery. That's pretty interesting. Not when they were free, but when they were enslaved, they became a great nation. Okay? So Abram wasn't even a Jew. He was a Gentile chosen to create a new generation of people, a new nation of people. And it wasn't later that they were, until they were called Jews because of Judea. That's where the name comes from, the people who lived in Judea. That's where the word Jew comes from. Okay? You can check me out if you want to online. All right? But going forward, here's what happens. He makes a promise with Abram. Genesis 12, 1. The Lord, got, uh, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your, family, your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you or treat you with contempt. Some versions say, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, so God gives Abram a land. Now, here's the thing. God did not give the Israelites or Abram's descendants this land because they were good. That's actually in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Uh, you can read that as well. And I think I actually messed up on my notes for that. Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 6. I put Genesis as an accident. But Deuteronomy 9, God didn't choose them because they behaved so well and they were so good. His grace chose them. So they would become a great nation and a holy nation. Just like us. God doesn't save us because we got everything together. He saves us out of grace and then we get our lives together. We come to Jesus and then we change. So real quick, if you've been trying to clean up your life in order to get saved by Jesus, stop doing that. Come to Jesus all messed up and he will clean your life up. That's what he wants you to do. So they were given this land. You ready for this? You can read it. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 9, 1 through 6. They were given this land because all the nations around them were wicked and God was punishing those nations. Because God didn't just look over one nation. He looks over at all nations. And they were living so wickedly, God was like, I'm going to have to banish them out of this land that's for my people, and now they're going to have this land. But they were also told, if you don't behave right, you're also banished from the land. And the Jews didn't. The Jews disobeyed God. And so Babylon captured them and took them out and removed them from the land. And that was their punishment for not listening to God's commands. Isn't that interesting? They were brought back by God's grace. You ready for this? 
they were given permission to go back by a pagan, ungodly, unrighteous king named Cyrus. He gave them permission to go back and rebuild the temple and the walls. And so they headed right back in by God's grace. All right, this is that story. Here's the thing, though. Let's go back a little bit. Abram didn't have a child. He didn't have his own son to create this nation. Now, he's, he's 100 years old. Sarai is, is 90. It's kind of impossible at this point. <laughs> right? Well, they waited and waited and waited, and they weren't having any children. Well, Sarai had a really bad idea. And Abraham went along with it, which was also a really bad idea. <laughs> Sarai said, why don't you take Hagar, our servant, why don't you sleep with her? And then that, that's how we build a nation. That is not God's plan. Don't rush God's plan. Don't take, don't be God. Right? And we, we get to learn from their mistake. <laughs> right? But God is so gracious, he cleans it up. But there's consequences to our sin. Did you know that the boy that was born from Hagar and Abram was Ishmael? Ishmael was what we believe and what Linnea just traced back to is what creates the Arab nations surrounding Israel. And now they all became mostly predominantly Muslim or Islam. Did you know Hamas is a terrorist group, Islamic terrorist group? Okay, so is Hezbollah. They worship Allah. They follow Islam. They are Muslims coming against God's people. The, the roots go back to Ishmael. Well, Ishmael didn't treat Isaac, which is now Abram and I, or Abraham and Sarah's son. They did have a child, thank God. And God said, he reaffirms it in Genesis, I believe 17. He says, this, my covenant is with your son Isaac. This land is yours. It's through your lineage and I will be your Lord. That's how we remember it. Ready? Land, lineage, and Lord. Ready for this? The other nation of people believe it's their land, their lineage, and their Lord, Allah. Do you see the conflict now? This has been raging on forever. But here's the thing. There's a cosmic spiritual battle going on behind all this. Because I want Muslims to be saved. I want Muslims to, to not do evil things. I want Christians to not do evil things. I want all people to not do evil things. And I want all people to be saved. Here's why. Because it would be through... Abraham's line that they would be a blessing to all people, including Gentiles, including Palestinians. And that blessing, his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ. But there is a conflict. Hagar and Ishmael were banished out of the home. God actually said that he would bless them. This is in the Bible. I can't make this up. It's in the Bible. And they were blessed, and they became a numerous nation. But later on, they become saved. Do you know ISIS members are getting saved? Terrorist members are getting saved by Jesus Christ. Muslims are getting saved by Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Jews are getting saved. Messianic Jews, those who believe in, in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But even Jews are converting to Christ because they're seeing this lineage line, and they're believing the Lord. And his name is Jesus Christ. They're believing him. Okay. So this, but let me, real quick, let me, again, let's show the big map. The big map again of the, um, I got some time. Are you guys okay? We're all buckled in? Okay. Little Israel, remember that? Did you know that's actually not their boundaries? Did you know that if you read Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 8, or Joshua 1, 3 through 4, they actually are supposed to have the land all the way to the Euphrates River? But Joshua, an Israelite, a Jew, was not, they, the, the people of God did ne never did, sorry, never did drive out all of the people that lived there. They lived among them. God said, remove them so you don't begin to worship their gods and their idols. Well, they never did fully remove all them. And because of that, Israel kept battling with gods and idols and worshiping other people besides God. Okay. So you want to see what their land is actually supposed to look like? Go to the next slide. If you read the boundaries according to God, that should be Israel. The little slice over there on the top with the red, that's what they have right now. Biblically, they were supposed to have all that. The Bible says all the way to the Euphrates River. No one knows this though. 
And partly it's because the Israelites didn't obey God. They didn't complete the task. Joshua did not complete the task. They did what they could. And God, God didn't, you know, didn't punish them for that. But they hurt themselves by not finishing the task. They got distracted by the world and other gods. All right? So even, even the Jewish people aren't perfect. Okay? God's people are not perfect. His chosen people. It's been a mess. But the Lord is still with them. Because he has a plan for them to bring them back to him. Real quick, um, what Hamas has done is just pure evil. And I, I'm shocked at the justification of it all. I am. Um, their name in Arabic means zeal. A passion. Uh, a passion for whatever their cause is, which we know what their cause is. If you read their charter... They want to be, uh, they want the whole land and they want Israel to not exist. It's pure evil. And zeal means great passion or enthusiasm for a cause. Do you know that in Genesis 6, 11 though, the Bible says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. The scripture originally in Hebrew, um, the scripture is originally in Hebrew, Okay before we have an English version. And the Hebrew word for violence in this verse, the first time ever used, is Hamas. So when, when Hamas says their name and what they want you to think and, and believe is they have, a, they, have, they have zeal for their just cause. Okay, let me read what I wrote. To the terrorists, they are practicing zeal, but to the Jews, they are practicing violence. So when the Jews hear that name, that word, they hear the word violence. Not peace, not war, violence. Now, violence is obviously an expression of war, okay? What's behind that? It's the spirit of the Antichrist in our world today. And the Antichrist, okay, the person, the figure, we don't know yet. But the spirit of the Antichrist has been at work, according to 1 John, for, for a long time. Why? Because it's Satan. He's anti-God. He is trying to counter everything. He doesn't want God's plan to take place. Do you know that Satan doesn't even want Palestinians to be saved? Do you know that Satan doesn't want Hamas to be saved? He doesn't want Jews to be saved. He doesn't want you to be saved. He doesn't want you to enjoy eternal life with God because he wants to be God. This is the conflict going on behind the scenes. So do not fall for the trap and the narrative, my friends. Especially young people, you're online all day and you're watching, you know, social media, TikTok, all that other stuff. And you're watching these, um, these protesters never, con never condemning the violence and stuff like that. Don't fall for the narrative trap. If you're a Christian, you need to have eyes that see things from a biblical perspective. Okay, and that goes for us too. All right, that goes for us. That goes for us too. As Christians, we see this completely, we, we see the connections in Bible, but we see it with, we want people to be saved. And we see that the devil's behind a lot of this. But ultimately, God is in charge. And God is allowing things to happen. He's leading things to happen for his purposes, which one day maybe we get to ask, why you do things the way you do it? I don't get it. But be careful that you don't get sucked in to this wrong narrative. As Christians, we should be praying for the salvation of Palestinians. We should be praying for the salvation of Jews. We should be praying for there to be a cease in conflict as much as possible. But I got a little news for you. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as the scripture says, do you know that you're actually praying for Jesus to come back? Because there's not going to be peace until he comes back, real peace. And here's what's tricky. The Antichrist will make us all think there is peace. See, the devil's once again trying to counterfeit everything God wants. Okay, we'll have peace, but uh, the Antichrist is gonna announce that and then he's gonna change his mind three and a half years in, in the middle of the tribulation. You see? So the devil's at work too. And people are falling for these traps because they don't have the knowledge of the word of God. 
In case you have, just in case you thought you didn't have to read the Bible, does this, think, does this make you think you need to read the Bible? I mean, think about it. It's worth it. Okay? It's worth it. How should we proceed? I'm going to wrap up. All right? How should we proceed? Well, I already started, you know, we need to pray. We do need to pray. You know, I don't want, I don't want to see the death and the violence to you. I don't, no one does. Ultimately, I've been praying for God's solution, for God's will, for his purposes to be done, for protection. I have been praying for peace. I've even prayed that Hamas would surrender and let go of all the prisoners. Just let them go. Surrender. I've been praying for Hamas's salvation because I don't want hell for anyone. Hell is going to be the worst place. It's going to be torment. Day after day, and there's not going to be a day. It's just eternity. There is, there is no timeline in eternity. It's just constant. I would never want that for anyone. I would want them to be saved. So I'm praying. We need to have faith eyes, okay? Faith eyes today, not just physical eyes. We live by faith even more than signs because some signs can be deceiving. So I live by faith in Christ and his word. I'm not going to get swept up in all the narratives. I'm going to look at Scripture and discern what's happening biblically and spiritually through Scripture. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, don't panic or be alarmed. You know why? He's on the throne. God is sovereign and overseeing what is happening with his purposes and plans in mind. He's got this. Right now, keep meditating on the word of God and keep your faith strong in Jesus Christ. Pray for the salvation of all people. Invite people to church. Right now, more people are open and asking questions than ever before. Uh, it's, it's incredible. The hunger for people to know what is going on. It has gotten the world's attention. And yes, there is end times connections to what's happening in Israel as we read today. That's just one example. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says this. This is how I live. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Take the opportunity right now, these evil days, to lead people to the truth of Jesus Christ. To bring people to church. Did you know that most people want to come to church? They're just waiting for an invite because they don't want to sit alone. And then they have one simple question. What am I supposed to wear? <laughs> it, it's, um, I mean, do you know how many people ask, which, what am I supposed to wear? We get that all the time. So, you know, yeah, clothes would be nice. <laughs> people people are, are just simply like needing an invite to come to church. Hey, you know, my pastor is covering signs of the end times. You want to join me next week? Do it. Watch what happens, all right? And, and, care, and, of course, carefully, we need to welcome people. Can I just, um, man, I'm going to get off sidetrack here for a bit. Can we stand up real quick as we close? I don't want to, the nursery workers are so gracious. They're still there. <laughs> I have to think of everything as a pastor, so it's thinking of that too right now. Um, can I just do a loving rebuke real quick? Is that Okay. I'm just going to do it anyway, okay. <laughs> I had a couple of stories come in where people were told they can't sit in a pew because they were already sitting there. And, you know, it just didn't come off right to one of the guests and it didn't come off right to someone else. You know, if, I know we like to save seats and stuff like that, but when, when there's someone brand new to the church or, and we say, no, you can't sit here, you know, that hurt to hear. You know, give up your seat for someone else. That's what Jesus would do. You know, I mean. And if, like, if like you absolutely need to be there because, like, handicap or something like that or, or some other situation, maybe you need to be near the door because you have a child or something, at least help them find a seat then, you know. Like, go the next step and do that. Because that, that one thing, you know how hard it is for people to want to come to church already? Because they, they think we're so judgmental and condemning. And then they finally muster up the courage to come. And then they hear that. Or they get that kind of treatment. That's just not cool. 
you know? So let's be gracious and loving and caring and sensitive. Let's greet people. Let's be, just be there and help people feel at home here. Because the more and more as the world comes to these end days, more and more people are going to actually come to church probably. All right? Because they're going to have questions. And so we can be ready. Sound good? Yeah. One of the key things here for you before we go is if you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because he's the ultimate plan in Genesis 12 to bless all people, all nations. If you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and Jesus is saving Jews, Palestinians, Muslims, everyone right now. He is saving people from every religion. If you need Jesus, our prayer team will be up here ready to pray with you. They want to talk to you about that decision, and they want to pray with you at the end of this, um, my prayer time. Okay, we're going to save that for that instead of right now, so you can have a quality conversation. Sound good? Don't rush out. That's one of the most important decisions you can make. Jesus was born. We're about to celebrate Christmas. I'm looking forward to it. The, the, the first coming of Christ, the advent of Christ, we're going to be celebrating soon here. All right? I'm getting a little ahead. It's Thanksgiving, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, we need to decorate stuff early because of Operation Christmas Child. So just be ready for that. Um, but the, the most important decision you can have right now is a relationship with Jesus Christ. He was born. He lived, he died, he rose again. He ascended to the Father. He's going to come back to take his church, his believers with him. So we want you to be ready. We want you to be ready. Amen. All right, let's pray. God, we, we thank you for your word. It's perilous times right now, and it's, it's terrible what we're seeing happening in the Middle East and around the world. Even right now, the threat of war in Taiwan that everyone's forgetting God, we have our eyes open. We are seeing the signs. Thank you, Lord, that we are not surprised because you gave us a heads up. And, Lord, you want us to just be ready now and help other people get ready, not wait for the last second to get ready. So I pray, Lord, you put it on people's hearts to trust in Jesus for salvation today. They can't clean themselves up. It has to be Jesus coming inside them, your Holy Spirit coming in and washing them of the old life, the life they think they can't let go, but Jesus gives them the power to let go. Jesus comes in and just breaks the shackles, breaks the chains, breaks the addictions. Come into them right now, Lord, and flood them with your presence, Lord. Save them, God, from things they think they can't be saved from. And Lord, change their life from this point forward. I thank you, God, you're doing that right now, online or in this room. Lord, you are moving by your power and you're giving people belief and faith that they can be saved and changed. But it's in Jesus Christ, not anything they can boast about. No works of man, it's all Christ. God, I pray you would move in their hearts to, to receive. And Lord, help us to be the church that's careful to discern the times we're living in and be ready and help other people get ready. Help us to be gracious and loving. Help us to speak the truth. Help us to stand on the truth. Help us not to be swayed, but to stay faithful to your word. I thank you for this church, God, who cares about your word and your work in this community and the world. We love you, God. We give you all the glory and praise for what you have taught us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great Sunday.